Hi, I am Malice and this is BD Mansi. I hope you'll enjoy this comic design essay. The storytelling of the comics is built by distributing many moments in the same space. This space can go from the book in its entirety and be divided into several subparts such as the panel, the strip, the page, or the double page and thus gather and assemble under our eyes multiple temporalities. When these different compartments are juxtaposed, the same character can exist in multiple ways within the same page and its different iterations will complement each other during our reading to form a coherent action. It is therefore not surprising to see the natural emergence of multiple character concepts in comics. We will see in detail here why this is interesting, and in the conclusion we will see why Naruto's famous multiple shadow clone technique is something very logical and powerful in a comic universe. Even before moving to a larger scale, there are often already different temporalities coexisting within a single panel which usually goes in the direction of reading, that is, from left to right in the Western comic. For example, in the case of a progressive advance of time, a first dialogue and its answer. This remains partly approximate as comics often maintain a convenient vagueness and flexibility in their representation of the passage of time. On this example of Asterix, the temporal place of the bubbles representing dialogues that respond to each other seems quite clear, but if we linger on that of the characters, the temporality becomes more ambiguous and mixed. It is important to point out that there are also many cases where several actions and dialogues within a single panel or even between several panels actually represent a single moment or a very close moment. For example, a drawing can show several characters performing multiple distinct actions, which the reader can take the time to decipher one by one and consider at the same time as a single unified sequence. This can also be done by multiple dialogues taking place at the same time, partially or entirely independent of each other, while keeping a perfect clarity between all these sounds, a temporality that is both blended and distinct at the same time. This tension between different temporalities and temporal lengths can be most noticeable when there is a great contrast between the length of a speech versus the frozen action of a character. Having a character talk during a fight is a comic book folklore that seems to have emerged quite naturally, as comics have a great temporal flexibility. This is also what makes some cartoon anime adaptations of these fight scenes sometimes seem a bit ridiculous or illogical if they are badly retransposed. In other cases, always within the same panel, the same character can also have different iterations and this in a very marked way. A draw may multiply a specific part of the character's body to show agitation or speed. The physical representation will then often be contrasted with the rest of his body, which is more inert, or even with the other characters, who will then be perceived as calmer or slower. The rapid movement of a striking arm can be further synthesized into a white line of speed that the eye does not have time to capture. The movement can then be mostly suggested, but drawing the fist in action several times is more of a reminder that a comic book character, while a still image, very often represents a body in motion, in action, a character with multiple temporalities. For example, a person's lips move to speak, but our experience of reality, our experience of understanding an image and the suggestion of that image is enough to make us understand that instinctively, without artifice. And this flexibility even allows you to make a character speak with his mouth closed, or to make him speak while he is drinking, which is for me one of the great folklores of the comic culture and which I love. Then, still on the same panel, a character can be shown at multiple very distinct moments, which can then bring the other characters back to their condition of fixed image either within the same panel or more globally. In a comic book, multiplying the temporality of a character often means multiplying his physical presence and thus giving him importance in the composition of the page. But this more atypical visual is in fact a detour of a very classical distribution of the action that we are used to see. If we modify and cut this long strip into several panels, where each Spider-Man becomes well isolated, we come back to this more classical scheme and thus to a lesser narrative break, something that is in fact less spectacular. We can see in this long Spider-Man panel a kind of use of a panoramic. When a series of panels extend the same image between them, as through the pieces of a puzzle, it is called a panoramic. For example, in this page from The Walking Dead, Negan sings a song to choose a victim at random. Here we have a combination of panoramic panels in the background and a misshapen puzzle in the foreground which gives Negan the appearance of an all-powerful five-armed monster against the other divided and submissive characters. An amazing use of comic storytelling based on duplication and juxtaposition of elements. The narration and our feeling are therefore greatly influenced by the way an author will distribute and manage the space of his comic. Each iteration of the character represents an anchor point in the unfolding of his action. We constantly make small comparisons between different elements that ultimately allow us to reconstruct the narrative with fluidity, progressively in the linear reading order and on a larger scale in a non-linear way. 
by the comparison games which are made at all scales and which can be pushed by an author through graphic correspondences. Here, the link between the two square panels of the appearance and disappearance of the spider is easily noticed. They have an atypical visual, they are each in the same panel size, and they are arranged in the same place in their respective pages arranged in front of each other. Everything pushes us to compare them. Here, this non-linear sense-making happens through direct comparisons of elements that are arranged in the same visible space, but it can also be done through more distant pages, and thus through the memory of the reader who, if he wishes, can easily turn a few pages back to verify a piece of information. Doing this can be part of the process of reading a comic and its panel flow, it is not really a break in the rhythm. Anyway, to get back to the heart of the video, this narrative process of duplication and juxtaposition makes that, even when the author's intention is not to show cloned or twin characters, in almost all comics, the same single character will regularly be multiplied and neighbouring itself. This is so common that in most cases it is no longer seen as an oddity. We saw that a comic character can express himself a lot by his occupation in the space of the page, and although it is not at all exclusive, the multiplication is one of the main ways to make the reader feel this. Starting from this common point of multiplicity present in all the characters, we can begin by taking as an example the Smurfs, an invention which seems so logical for the comics. The Smurfs initially compose a village of 99 citizens, and their force on their enemy, the sorcerer Gargamel, will indeed be their number, but not only. Their strength also comes from their impact of being almost all the same. The Smurfs are almost all interchangeable. As we will see, this allowed Peyo, their Belgian creator, to sometimes make them act both individually and collectively. Note that this has changed a bit over time, as the Smurfs have had more and more distinct personalities and visuals within their village, which will eventually give limits to the setting I'm about to discuss. As we have seen, a character that is multiplied within the same panel is a code that stands out, a sometimes eccentric visual that does not fit into the grammar of all comics. The more the character will be multiplied, the more it will have chance to stand out. On these two panels, you can see three moments of the same action facing a frozen opponent. The first Smurf jumps from his hiding place, the second starts to run towards the enemy, and the third raises his weapon to hit him, an attack in three times shown at the same time at three different moments by three different characters. As a result, by using character clones, an author like Peyo can also cut the same action into several parts in a single panel, which is visually identical to an ultra-fast Guts from Berserk, but which is nevertheless perceived as much softer because it is not spectacular, and which thus corresponds better to the more discrete narration and aesthetics of a classic Franco-Belgian comic. So, on the one hand, we have a multiplication of the same character who cuts in the same panel his action in several key moments. And on the other hand, we also have in the same panel the cutting of the same action in several key moments, but which is also in the same time several really independent actions because executed at the same time by several individuals. This image implies that the smurf on the left will then proceed to execute the next action on his right, and that the smurf on the right has just executed the two actions on his left. If we want to make a point of it, we could say that Guts relies here only on himself, whereas the smurfs are codependent. The Smurfs represent the unification, the coordination, and thus the complicity between characters, united by a community, a village. These two visuals work very well with the collaboration between several still images, reading at the same time in a linear way and apprehending at the same time in its totality. Always this idea of comparison game which is I think one of the driving forces that guide the reading of a comic. Another detail to add on the appearance of the Smurfs, and which is not specific to the comics, it also allows the Smurfs to have a common background, since they are very often interchangeable. Through their adventures, each of them could be at one time in the spotlight before returning to the anonymous mass. We can always have fun speculating which Smurf in one panel was in the spotlight in another story. The Beagles boys are not strictly identical as they each have a different prisoner number, but the idea of a clone character remains the same, especially since it is a very discrete element. In Don Rosa's work, we can also see characters carrying out and completing the same action. My examples are taken from Dream of a Lifetime. Note that in this episode of Scrooge, we can see that this visual narration in one panel is much more used and probably conscious than in the Smurfs. In this 26 pages story by Don Rosa, it is very frequent and you could see that it is sometimes very explicit. It would also have been possible to do this for Huey, Dewey and Louie, but here they help each other without resorting to this unfolding visual, or to a much lesser degree than their enemies. Perhaps Don Rosa wanted to characterise the Beagles boys and make them more unique in the story. Since they are Disney characters, they have been taken over by many different people, and I don't know how widespread this visual is or isn't through the comics among the Beagles boys or nephews, but via Smurfs and Beagles boys it's interesting to think that different authors may have independently had similar ideas for their characters and settings. I couldn't prove this of course, although I tend to think that the concept of a clone character complementing each other in the same action is one that may have emerged naturally in different places, comics being a good breeding ground for this. 
We will now see that in the case of the Dalton brothers from Lucky Luke comics, the variation between the characters is more marked than in the case of the Beagles boys, and that this therefore changes the situation and the narrative opportunities. The Daltons will sometimes represent this idea of unification that we have seen so far. It can show their brotherhood and coordination. Here, they demonstrate their bond by completing the same action in an absurd way. Joe drinks a bottle of alcohol and the impact of his gesture extends through his brothers and the panels all the way to Avril who ends up drunk. The strange visual connection between these brothers can sometimes be shown monstrous by presenting them as a hydra or an evil totem. But one of the great characteristics of the Daltons is their disorganization and their almost continual disagreements, an ironic disharmony shown by their failed cloning. They hate each other but are united for life. They are both coordinated and uncoordinated. To illustrate this disharmony of siblings, there is this beautiful example of false multiplication of a limb, which can be seen as a parody of a classic comics drawing code. In this panel, the Daltons can't get their act together even though they are being dragged into a waterfall. In the narrative, the size of each Dalton determines his role and character. The two brothers that stand out are Joe, the smallest, and Avril, the largest, and are therefore the two most characterized brothers. Joe is the meanest and the boss, Avril the nicest and the dumbest. On the contrary, William and Jack are much more effaced. They are in the middle, it is difficult to differentiate them physically and in their personality. We can only be sure to differentiate them when they are in their group. They are mostly used as an extension to Joe and to link from or to Avril. All this is mechanically logical. The character's purpose is also carried by his physicality, which influences his occupation in space and which can consequently define a role for him. In the continuity of the analysis of the storytelling seen previously with the Smurfs and the Beagle Boys the majority of the time, the grouped action of the Dalton will also be shown in the same panel, and not in a larger sequence. However, the idea of the action gradually completing itself between each iteration will not be the norm here. When the Daltons act in a unified manner, they will often be in an often partial repetition of the same action. Is these examples we are in a different situation than before? Here the authors Morris and Gossini will be able to be in the strict repetition of an action while keeping, thanks to the size game, a continuous variation between the iterations. To accentuate this visual narration and to fit well with the linear reading direction of a comics, the Daltons will very often be arranged in a line which has become the cult pose of these characters. The repetition here gives a visual and therefore a rather different impression compared to if the Daltons were strictly the same. There can be a feeling of evolution in the repeated action, of an ascent or a descent, and thus of a progressive or digressive accentuation according to the place of the different Daltons in the reading order. And so, when there is a break in this repetition, it will be done very naturally by Avril and or Joe, who are once again the two most characterized characters, and who moreover are each at the end of the line, at the beginning or at the end in the reading order, and so at the beginning or at the end of an action. All this seems very logical. At times, Joe, the leader at the head of the line, can be seen to be doing an action that the rest of the group imitates, as they are subservient to him. For info, in the story, Joe is a little tyrant. The repetition is both instantaneous and in crescendo, always in this idea of understanding both linear and global. In the same idea, the repeated word may seem more and more stupid each time until Avril its climax. The same goes for the number four, which also makes it possible to make their reaction understood off screen, even when it only represents a mute astonishment. As I will show in a next video on the evolution of Lucky Luke's shooting, the use of the off screen to personalize characters is one of the settings that characterizes Morris and Gossini in this series. Each balloon corresponds to the Dalton brother in its order of size. The balloons become here a kind of metaphor, an incarnation of the Dalton brothers, who are thus well characterized by the number four, the repetition, and the arrangement from top to bottom. And once again by the visual narration of the text, on the contrary, the ironic disharmony that characterizes the Daltons can be shown by a common bubble, but in which the text is at the same time identical and badly tuned in its verticality, just like their physique is. Until now I have almost only talked about actions spread on a same panel, but it can of course also be done on a larger scale, as we will see a bit with Naruto. Because I think that the narrative interest of a comics is built a lot on the juxtaposition of several panels which take their full meaning by fitting together. The condensed visual of the previous examples can be compared as a variation of the narrative by juxtaposed panels, and it is on this foundation that we can find more or less atypical and interesting a storytelling like the one of Beagle Boys or Spider-Man. We can therefore see the use of character duplication as a way of condensing the narration of a complex or long action into a single panel and thus punctually replacing the more classic narration which would therefore require several panels. After all we have seen, it makes sense that in Naruto, multiple shadow clone technique is one of the most highlighted techniques of this manga, as the feeling of this power is particularly effective in this medium. 
It is a technique of space occupation and multiplication of its iterations, a perfect jutsu to dominate a comic book page through visual storytelling. In this important fight against Kabuto, we will see Naruto evolve through different steps of duplication. The narration is also going to pass by the accentuation of this type of visual. In the bottom strip, just before the beginning of the fight, the triple iteration is a simple zoom on Naruto alone, and not his clones. But this reminds the reader that duplication is a very common visual code in comics, which the author will then partly divert. Naruto starts the fight by running towards his enemy while creating his clones. The start of this power will be shown on the same panel where Naruto's body starts to multiply. On the next double page, Kabuto will keep his immobile place in the middle of the panel which will accentuate his inertia. Except that this time, Naruto is going to surround him from both sides of the pages on the large spread of the top panel. An accentuation of the occupation of the space which is done in two times and accompanies the intention and the evolution of Naruto's action. But Kabuto's domination will be quickly shown by the fact that he scatters all Naruto on separate panels. Kabuto is going to highlight the weakness of this attack which is disordered, scattered in small panels and partly separated on the two pages, in contrast with the first big unifying panel. The clones having been eliminated, Naruto then tries a first time to make a Rasengan, in which we see his hand in triple to indicate a fast and rotating movement. We have a visual storytelling close to the launch of his cloning, except that here he is alone to compensate for this multiplication. The technique will not be done well enough yet and will fail quickly. Then Naruto will create a clone to help himself. He will then be able to combine the two types of visual seen before. He multiplies both his whole body and a part of his body. Thanks to this, with one hand, he will be able to immobilize his opponent while executing his technique with his three remaining hands. This allows him for the first time to create a real Rasengan and reverse the situation. It is an important moment in the story and shows the genius of Naruto, genius that emerged from the solitude that shaped him which he uses to help others. It is a powerful symbolic moment of this manga. We can see that the similarity between these two important panels of the fight is quite striking, but they are very different in their evocation. It is as if Naruto got this idea of cloning by looking at his multiplied hands in the scene. Throughout this manga, multi-cloning will be one of Naruto's main techniques. During the story, through his clones, Naruto can thus alternate the visual storytelling of his action and make combinations of them. The following examples are from the fight against Neji and show the diversity of these combinations. Naruto and his clones can be synchronized within the same panel or from panel to panel. He can complete his speech from iteration to iteration within the same panel or on several panels. It can give the impression of movement through the repetition of several bodies yet motionless. He can surround his opponent both in the scene and in the layout. We can continue to compare the similarity in the representation of the action between panels but which however have a very different reality within their story. According to the narrative logic of the moment, the visual storytelling of Naruto, who starts a sentence to complete it on another panel, can also be done from clone to clone or by Naruto alone, who will then be just a classic repetition of the same character. An eccentric technique like cloning is shown and integrated with fluidity. The cloning is therefore sometimes here only a putting back into perspective of a very classical code of comics narration. And without going into too much detail, the large-scale multiplied enemy is just a continuation of that, besides the fact that it's less of a headache for an illustrator to create an enemy to duplicate over and over again. Whether it is by cloning or a covering uniform, it avoids having to give them a physical personality which also often allows to dehumanize his opponent and to make it mob trash. And at the same time, it can allow to tell the fight of an individual against an overwhelming and normalizing institution. In the visual storytelling, the heroes are valorized and heroic because facing a large indistinct crowd. We can also find this principle of multiplication for non-human peoples and thus avoid the illustrator having to give a crowd of individuals as much variety as we find in humans. It is a very slippery slope because it can refer to a racist thought as in Tintin in the Congo or in Willy and Wanda where a people will be once again dehumanized. Here it is again not an analysis specific to comics but as comics is an art that can tend to make emerge naturally and value this kind of multiple character it was interesting to make this little parenthesis. Thus comics can particularly enhance this kind of concept thanks to its specific storytelling because it is never more than a highlighting of a grammar already very much installed in every page. Just zooming in on the same character requires showing it several times. A zoom in a cartoon or a movie is therefore not the equivalent of a zoom in a comics because once again the juxtaposition of images is an essential key. The reader can compare and relate very directly elements spread out in different places and the multiplication or even the repetition of the drawing is an often central component in the comics. Last detail, otherwise I would have been upset with myself for not having mentioned it at all. The reflections, mirrors, portraits in a comic book can have a special place in the narration, but this is a subject of its own. The purpose of this video was not to be exhaustive. There are still many things to say on the subject, in particular by multiplying the examples through more comics, but I hope that it will have been able to launch tracks of thoughts.
Thanks for taking the time to listen to me. I still have many other topics already covered on my channel in French and I would like to make an English version. So I say to you soon for next videos.